My sermon passages are John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15, and Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. First, John 16, 12 to 15. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. He says, I have yet many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Now Romans 5, 1 to 5. Paul the Apostle is writing. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has been given to us. The word of the Lord. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. <clears throat> I have a preface and an introduction before the sermon. <laughs> the preface is this. Some preachers pray Psalm 19.4 before every sermon. Those who don't, when they do, it's because usually they know they're fixing to crawl out on a limb with their people, or they're not 100% sure in what it is that they're going to say, but they feel compelled to say it anyway. That's the preface. Now the introduction. Psalm 19.4. <laughs> that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. This thought behind this sermon is a work in progress. That's what I want to say. I'm almost always confident that I know what I want to say when I preach, right or wrong. I'm confident that I need to say this, but I'm not confident that it's done yet. It may need some more time in the oven. Now the sermon. How's this for a church slogan? Imagine it on a sign out front. <laughs> yes, you did laugh that out loud. <laughs> the angel said to Sarah. <laughs> How's this for a church slogan? Let us suffer with you. It beats come suffer with us, maybe a little, which I have considered. As I said, I'm still working this out with fear and trembling. I'm still working out what it means to be led by the Spirit to suffer for Christ as he suffered for the world as part of, if not the heart of, God's plan, suffering God's plan. I'm working out suffering with fear and trembling just as I continue to work out my salvation with fear and trembling, which is where that comes from, right? As the Apostle Paul advised in Philippians, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Or as another translation puts it, I work with fear and trembling to discover what it really means to be saved. I like that. So, I work out with fear and trembling what it means to suffer. Suffer in salvation. But I repeat myself. Salvation is suffering. Suffering is salvation. And I've got question marks around that. Come suffer with us, I mentioned as a possible church slogan here two years ago. I sort of mentioned it. What I said was, it's probably a good thing that we don't have a big, out sign, a big sign out front announcing, come suffer with us, because it's not going to pack the pews. It's not the best slogan for marketing purposes. It's not the best sermon title. Come suffer with us. But I thought, actually, it might get some people passing by to stop in. But maybe this would be better. Let us suffer with you because we're probably only going to get people to join us in here after we've shown them that we're willing to join them out there. 
and then after we come clean about something. We have to come clean about something. Following Christ ain't no picnic. You're going to lose something. Wealth, reputation, standing, time, money, opportunity, family. You're going to lose something. In the extreme, we could lose our life itself. And if you have not lost anything at all, who is it you're following? Because the way of Jesus is the way to Jerusalem and infamy, not popularity and prosperity. It's the way to the cross, a bloody instrument of capital punishment, the way before it was a beautiful piece of jewelry. It's the way to what do I have to give, not what do I get. The way of Jesus is we're all in this thing together, not it's me and my personal Jesus. The old hymn says, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? No, there's a cross for everyone and there's a cross for me. There is a cross for everyone. There is suffering for everyone from the suffering Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to the rest of the greater suffering body of Christ, to us here as family, friends, and fellow travelers with the Lord, Suffering is the very thing that holds it all together, I think, thanks to Jesus. Listen to Paul again. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in our hope of sharing the glory of God. More than that, more than the glory of God then, Paul says, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us because, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, which has given, been given to us. That's what sustains us. Poured into us our faith, peace, grace, glory, suffering, endurance, hope, and love. In the rhetoric of Paul's day, the most important part of persuasion, whether it was a short story or an argument or a list, if he was trying to persuade somebody, the most important point he was making went right in the middle. The rhetoric of their day, not at the top and not at the bottom, like it would be for us mainly, right? We build up to a point or we declare a point and then we justify it. In the rhetoric of the day, it was right in the middle. So listen again to the results of our justification in Christ Listen again to the gifts of our salvation. Faith, peace, grace, endurance, hope, love, and smack in the middle, glory and suffering. Those are the most important things in that list from Paul. Suffering and glory. That sounds like an oxymoron. Doesn't compute. But God's power is made perfect in what? Weakness. God's power and glory are made complete in weakness and in suffering. Come suffer with us or let us suffer with you whichever way. Suffering is the way. Where followers of Jesus are, there is suffering because followers of Jesus go where suffering is because that's where Jesus is. That's where he leads us. That's how God is saving the world in Christ despite all evidence to the contrary. That's how. Not with success on a cruise ship full of the fat and happy. No offense. <laughs> but with suffering on a life raft loaded down with poor rescued refugees in the thing together. Poor in spirit, health, and the pocketbook too. By suffering, having compassion. Somebody pointed out that the Latin roots of the word compassion are calm, which means with, and passion, which did not always mean what it mostly means now, which is strong and compelling emotion, right? I'm passionate about the thunder, or I'm passionate about the Texas Rangers or whatever. Passion did not mean strong emotion. It meant suffering. The passion of Christ does not mean, does not refer to his emotions. The story of the passion of Christ is the story of his suffering. So to have compassion for someone means to suffer with them, to ride with them on the life raft until all can be rescued. To have compassion means more than to understand someone's pain. 
It means more than to feel their pain. It means to be one with them in their pain. It means to sit at the hospital bed with them. Just to be there, to share their air, and to share their space. Just for an example. It means to be one with them in their pain and their suffering. Christ became one with humanity. The incarnation, Christ became one with humanity so that we all could become one with one another in our suffering, which is life. That's life. It's suffering or doing everything we can to avoid it, put it off, numb it, or stop it. From the first gasp of our breath to the last beep of the machine. That and the immoral criminal exploitation of that is the heart of the opioid crisis, among many other crises. That's how salvation works with suffering. God suffers by giving Jesus. Jesus suffers by giving up his divine human life. The Spirit suffers by lowering to us to sustain us in our walk, guiding us to truth with others who follow the risen but still suffering, nail-scarred Christ with his sacred, bleeding heart. Remember in Revelation, the lamb, the risen, bloodied, slaughtered lamb, that oxymoronic image, it's both power and weakness. That's the crux of the matter. That's the cross of the matter. Paul says we have all we need. Paul says we have all we need because God in Christ gives us all he has through the Spirit. That is so profound. It's such a Trinitarian thing, Trinitarian thing today, Sue conven to, to, today conveniently on Trinity Sunday. God in Christ gives us all he has through the Spirit. That's what Jesus says in that gospel passage. In John 16, the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ, magnifies Christ, makes Christ of the ultimate importance for us. Quote, for he, the Spirit, will take what is mine and declare to you. And what is that? Jesus says, all that the Father has, all that the Father God has is mine, Christ said. Therefore, the Spirit will take what is mine now and declare it to you. We have all God has to give us to do what God would have us do. Whew. That's, that's, that's something. We have all we need to live for God in service to one another and others through suffering in glory because God in Christ Gave us all he had. Salvation is so not just about me and the mystical relationship I have with Jesus. Although that's pretty cool. Isn't it? Lord deliver the church though. Especially in this country from the selfishness and rampant individualism. Because Jesus himself said it takes two or three. There are no loners in Christ. But we, we have all we need to love God and love our neighbors, even to love our enemies. We have all we need to create justice, to pray down and build up God's will on earth as it is in heaven. We together have all we need because God in Christ gives us all God has. I'm hammering it because I didn't, I, I didn't get that myself till I dove deep yesterday in the scripture to come up with a message for you. That's so awesome. Let's quit whining. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm the only one that whines sometimes. I have no right to whine. God has given me all I need to do what God wants me to do with y'all. <clears throat> By the way, there's no bait and switch with Paul, like there is with some preachers. But this is the cold hard truth. Some in this life who suffer are broken, and they will remain broken. And what though the suffering Christ is especially close to them in their suffering? And we should be too. To be close to Christ, we need to go and suffer with them especially. To love is to suffer. To love is to suffer. To be diminished. To give. To sacrifice for the ones that you love. That's love. It's time to mention John Perkins again. John Perkins, you've heard me quote him before. Dr. John M. Perkins, an African-American minister born in 1930 in Mississippi. The Reverend Dr. Perkins has a warning for ministers of the gospel. And we are all ministers of the gospel. So let's all listen. When God calls, he calls us to a hazardous mission. When God calls, he doesn't invite us to a picnic. 
He calls us to go to a stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn people. No offense to anyone present or absent. In a minute, I'll make this relevant with a story about going to stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn people. Dr. Perkins dares Christians, and he dares churches to cross lines to get to where suffering people are. He was inspired by white preachers in the 60s in Mississippi who wouldn't. He wrote, Those churches that respond most passionately to the needy are those who have sent out from their own congregations people to live and walk and eat and breathe among the poor and who have then heard their eyewitness accounts of the need, the opportunity, and the challenge. It could be that cooperating with the co that cooperating with a non with the nonprofit Restore OKC, which we're still talking, it could be that that will give Trinity new opportunities to do just that because that's what they do. More to come on that. In a few minutes, I'll make this relevant with a story about going passionately to the needy and the poor, for eyewitness accounts of greed, of, of need, opportunity, and challenge. First, the stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn people. This week outside the White House was no picnic for the Reverend Dr. William Barber and hundreds of other interfaith leaders, according to CommonDreams.org, a progressive social justice news site. Hundreds of ministers stood ready to be arrested on Wednesday when they delivered what they called a moral indictment to an immoral administration. The march and rally were organized to denounce the Trump administration's cruel, unjust policies, including detaining migrant children and attacking access to health care. The Reverend Dr. Barber is a Disciples of Christ minister, a, a, a pastor. He's president of the social justice group Repairers of the Breach, and he's co-chairman of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, which he has revived from Dr. King. He said, Jeremiah 22 tells us that when political leaders abuse their office and hurt the poor, we must show up in person to deliver a prophetic indictment now is the time. The Reverend Benjamin Perry, a Presbyterian minister, PCUSA, reported, tweeting from the scene, Secret Service told hundreds of clergy it would be a felony if we set foot on Pennsylvania Avenue to bring our petition near the White House. While kidnapping and imprisoning children is evidently lawful, protesting that violence is a crime. At the gate of the White House, they delivered signed petitions, which state in part, as President Trump and his administration let the nation suffer, we must lead with a unified, proactive, and creative response that is not confined by right or left, Democrat or Republican, but is rooted in the clear moral center of right and wrong. It's time to warn the nation and call this administration to repent of their sins. Among other things, these compassionate and passionate ministers demanded that the administration and its backers in Congress stop weaponizing judicial appointments, attend to the 14th Amendment, the bedrock of equal protection under the law, and uphold the Constitution. Stop moves to mandate a census question designed to ensure that millions of people go uncounted, again going against the Constitution which says count the people, not the citizens and attend to the 140 million of us who are poor. Stop the assault on health care for women and children in poverty. Attend to the health of your people. Stop the brutal treatment of the stranger at our southern border. Stop warehousing children in detention camps. End child detention. Attend to compassionate and humane immigration policies that affirm the divinity within all human beings. They went on, these sinful acts of the administration pursue subjugation, subjugation of racial, religious, ethnic, and gender minorities, of women, of children, of the suffocating middle class, workers, family farmers, the poor, and people who fall sick. They subjugate immigrants and refugees. They subjugate the free press, even the Constitution, even of Earth, our common home. It must not stand, end quote. Barber told the Washington Post that evangelical church leaders' support for inhumane laws and policies must not go unchallenged. He said, quote, the Trump administration, I never say just Trump because he's not by himself, has violated everything that Jesus said ought to be the first priority of nations. 
And so it grieves me that brothers and sisters who claim to follow Jesus would do this and would be so loud on things that Jesus is so quiet about and so quiet on the very thing that Jesus is so loud about. And that's why it must be challenged. It cannot be allowed to just exist and be called evangelicalism when many, when, when many times it is a form of heresy. <clears throat> the Reverend Dr. William Barber is on fire and we must pray for his safety. Now, with Reverend Dr. Perkins' challenges to churches in mind, a shorter story about going compassionately to the needy and the poor for eyewitness accounts of need, opportunity, and challenge. It's a shorter story for lack of details and because potential solutions are so complex. CNN and others reported the other day that the Trump administration is running out of space to house migrant children who arrive at the southern border without a parent or guardian. So the Department of Health and Human Services said it will send some to Fort Sill, which has a history of such things. Fort Sill held an internment camp for Japanese Americans during World War II, which I did not know. Did you? 700, which is a tiny number, unless you're one of them. And it was the hub for moving American Indians onto reservations in the 1870s, which I did know, and I think most of us know. To be fair, the Obama administration also used Fort Sill to house migrant children. Progressive pastors across the state are organizing quietly a trip to Fort Sill to attempt to minister to these children, to see what they can see here, uh, see and hear. And they're also going as a, Christus, as a Christian witness to the need for justice on the border and in the borderlands, which now includes pretty much the entire United States. This whole country is, is the borderlands now. This problem is not going away, and we here can't do much. But I think our next series of workshops, I think our next 10 weeknight workshops on race and reconciliation are gonna be teaching and discussing race and immigration. I was at the border in Arizona nine years ago. If the Lord wills, I'm going again this October to Texas to the needy and the poor for eyewitness accounts of need, opportunity, and challenge and see how we can do whatever it is that God would have us do. Stay tuned as I and we work it out even with fear and trembling, as we work out what it means to be led by the Spirit to suffer for Christ with the world. Dear America, we suffer with you. Dear God, show us the way out. Dear children, may we suffer with you. Dear God, show us the way in. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Dear God, amen. Thank you.